All right, if I'm going to turn in your Bibles to Leviticus chapter 23. Derek knows where we're going today. So as I mentioned in the announcements today for the second service, the plan today is to go over the topic of the Passover, particularly looking at the aspect of the participation of it. Who can participate, who who not participate in it. But before we get to that point, I just want to do a very brief summary or dealing with where the Bible talks about this feast in particular. Leviticus 23 is the primary chapter that, not the first place it's mentioned, but as far as laying out the different feasts overall. So take a look at Leviticus 23 and verse 4. So here it says, These are the feasts of the Lord, even holy convocations, which ye shall proclaim in their seasons. In the fourteenth day of the first month at even is the Lord's Passover. And on the fifteenth day of the same month is the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Unto the Lord seven days ye must eat unleavened bread. In the first day ye shall have a holy convocation, ye shall do no servile work therein, but ye shall offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord seven days. In the seventh day is an holy convocation, ye shall do no servile work therein. So here we have the laying out of the first two of the spring feasts, Passover, followed immediately by the Feast of Eleven Bread, which lasts for seven days. Now, as I point out before, but I think it's good for repetition, is a reminder that in verse 4, we see that word feasts. The word behind feast is moedim, which means appointed times. And so it is like God's calendar dates that he has preset, that he says, I want my people to follow. And the common misconception is that these feasts are, as people would term today, Jewish feasts or Hebrew feasts or Israelite feasts. But notice what it says there in verse 4 again. It says, these are the feasts of the Lord. They're Jehovah's feasts. They're not our feasts. They're his feasts. He says, I want you to participate in my feasts. And so we see here that there are his appointed times, the word behind feasts. And then also, we see the word convocations. The word behind convocations means to assemble together for rehearsal. It's the idea of rehearsing something. These feasts are not meant to just be some sort of ritual. They are meant to point to something that we are rehearsing together as God's people for a future event or things that would happen in the future. So it's interesting because the whole thing connected with the Passover, when it was formally inaugurated or codified, related to a past event. And that becomes significant when you start considering the feast and connected to prophecy. Not the purpose of this message whatsoever, but realize that when we're participating in these things, we are rehearsing. We're learning things about what God wants us to know about in the future, and he expects us to understand. So if we are there for when he meets with his people on his appointed time, we will be ready to participate in that, in that event. And so the first of the spring feast is Passover and eleven bread. And we see here that it happens on the first day, uh, the first, excuse me, the first month, on the 14th day is Passover. And then in the same month, the next day, the day 15th through the 21st, is the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And so in anticipation of these unco- upcoming feasts for the spring feasts, and of course, in the middle of unleavened bread, we also have the feast of first fruits is the question of who is allowed to participate, particularly related to the Passover. The Passover is the only feast that has qualifications associated with it that lays it out in Scripture. So the best place to go and start dealing with this is in Exodus chapter 12. This is where God decrees it. I do not believe this is the first time that God has actually used this appointed time because it's very clear when he leads them out, he says that this It was the exact same day that they began their sojourning in the land, which points to the day that Abraham left Ur and crossed over into the promised land, 430 days, 430 years earlier. So God uses these times to meet and work with his people. God uses a calendar. God is predictable. God is orderly. And so... This is an important concept to understand, which is so different than what uh, is, is promoted in Christianity today, because the idea is, is that we don't know. But God says, I'm showing you. And if you follow these things, you'll understand my appointed times. 
So we've looked at different aspects of that. So here, in Exodus chapter 12, we look at verse 1. We see here, in the first 14 verses, dealing with the clarification of the significance of this day. It says, The Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month shall be unto you the beginning of months. So God is trying to help them understand the ordering of the calendar, and this has to do with the religious calendar, as he's establishing here, and then say what days I want you to do what things on. It says, It shall be the first month of the year to you. Speak ye unto all the congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth day of this month, they shall take to them every man a lamb, according to the house of their fathers, a lamb of a house. And if the household be too little for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next unto his house take it according to the number of the souls. Every man according to his eating shall make your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. You shall take it out from the sheep or from the goats, and you shall keep it up until the fourteenth day of the same month, and the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. And they shall take of the blood and strike it upon the two side posts, and on the upper door post of the house, the houses, wherein they shall eat it. And they shall eat the flesh in that night, roast with fire and unleavened bread, and with bitter herbs they shall eat it. Eat not of it raw, nor sodden at all with water, but roast with fire his head and his legs, and with the pertinence thereof. And you shall let nothing of it remain until the morning, and that which remaineth of it until the morning you shall burn with fire. And thus shall ye eat it with your loins girded, with your shoes on your feet, and your staff in your hand, and ye shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. For I will pass through the land of Egypt this night, and will smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt will I will execute judgment. I am the Lord." And the blood shall be to you for a token upon the houses where ye are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you, and the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. And this day shall be unto you for memorial, and ye shall keep it a feast to the Lord throughout your generations. Ye shall keep it. It's a feast by an ordinance forever. So this, this here is, is God laying this out so they understand what they're supposed to, to eat, how they're supposed to eat it, uh, what day, all that sort of thing that's, that's connected to this. And so we see here, though, in this passage, this was an instruction for all the congregation of Israel. God instructed Moses to say, tell my people this. So this was directed to the people. So again, if you go back to the, the uh, uh, verse 3 there, it says, Speak ye unto all the congregation of Israel, saying this. So this was directed to God's people and God's people alone. And we saw as well in verse 14 that this was an ordinance forever. It says, This day shall be unto you a memorial, and ye shall keep it a feast to the Lord throughout your generations. Ye shall keep it a feast by an ordinance forever. And so this, this is very clear that God expects his people to keep this. Now, Moses was to give this to Israel, but he was not to declare this to the Egyptians or others in Egypt. The Egyptians knew the event of this plague was coming, but not the remedy and how the Lord would, how Lord's people would be spared. So if you go back to the previous chapter, take a look at chapter 11, and this is important because this clarifies part of who's supposed to participate in this. Because it's not those opposed to God, but those that are for God, those that are his people. Exodus 11 Take a look at verse 1. It says, The Lord said unto Moses, Yet will I bring one plague more upon Pharaoh and upon Egypt. Afterward he will let you go hence. When he shall let you go, he shall surely thrust you out hence together. Speak now in the ears of the people, and let every man borrow of his neighbor and every woman of her, of her neighbor jewels of silver and jewels of gold. And the Lord gave the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians. Moreover, the man Moses was very great in the land of Egypt, in the sight of Pharaoh's servants, and in the sight of the people. So here we see the, the context going into this. This has to do with the last plague. God has announced to Moses and say, after you declare this, that, and it happens, that they will be thrust out and, and, God, and that, that Pharaoh will finally let you go. And now we get into verse 4. And this is Moses speaking to Pharaoh directly. We'll find this out exactly in verse 8. But notice how it says in verse 4, it says, And Moses said, Thus saith the Lord, he's speaking to Pharaoh here, About midnight will I go out into the midst of Egypt, and all the firstborn in the land of Egypt shall die. 
from the firstborn of Pharaoh that sitteth upon his throne, even unto the firstborn of the maidservant that is behind the mill, and all the firstborn of beasts. And there shall be a great cry throughout all the land of Egypt, such as there was none like it, nor shall be like it any more. But against any, any of the children of Israel shall not a dog move his tongue against man or beast, that ye may know how that the Lord doth put a difference between the Egyptians and Israel. And all these thy servants shall come down unto me, and bow down themselves unto me, saying, Get thee out, and all the people that follow thee, and after that I will go out. And it says, And he went out from Pharaoh in a great anger. So you can see here that through Moses, God declares, There's another plague coming. This one's going to be devastating. And after this occurs, you're going to send servants to me, Pharaoh, to send us out. And so Moses goes out here uh, uh, angry after uh, making this announcement uh, due to the frustration and Pharaoh's hardening of his heart. And so, so we see that this message of the Passover was going to the congregation of Israel, is not going to Egypt. Egypt received the warning that judgment was coming, but not the remedy. Basically, you deserve judgment, and this is God's judgment. But you'll see the difference between you, your animals, and God's people and their animals. And so we move on in chapter 12, and we find more record associated with instruction of this feast. And we find here an emphasis that there was something that was to carry into the future. So take a look at, at Exodus 12, and let's pick it up in verse 24. It says here, And ye shall observe this thing for an ordinance to thee and to thy sons forever. And it shall come to pass, when ye come to the land which the Lord will give you, according as he hath promised, that ye shall keep this service. And it shall come to pass, when your children shall say unto you, What mean ye by this service? That ye shall say, It is, a, it is the sacrifice of the Lord's Passover, who passed over the houses of the children of Israel in Egypt, when he smote the Egyptians and delivered our houses. And the people bowed the head and worshipped. And so here we see this emphasis that this was something that was to carry on. This was not a one-time event. God expected his people to, to continue to do this year after year. And so we see again in verse 27, similar to Leviticus 23, where it says, that you shall say it is the sacrifice of the Lord's Passover. This is the Lord's Passover. It's not the people's Passover. It's the Lord's Passover as well, is connected to the service of the Lord. So we see that as well in verse 26. It says, um, It shall come to pass when your children shall say unto you, What mean ye by this service? And we see the same word, service, in verse 25 as well. So this is all connected to service of the Lord. When we participate in the feast, we're serving the Lord as part of our service to Him. It's clear that this is what the Lord desires of His people. And in verse 42, we'll get there in a moment, but you look down ahead to verse 42, notice what it says there as well. A similar thing, it says, It is a night to be much observed unto the Lord for bringing them out from the land of Egypt, that it is that night of the Lord to be observed of all the children of Israel in their generations. So this is something God wants to be carried out in the future. It is hard to walk away from the text and not understand that God expected his people to keep these feasts. Now, of course, there's another conversation to define God's people and who's to expect and such. I, and I'm going to go in a lot of detail on that here today, but, but realize there's an instruction here for that. Uh, go back down here to Exodus, I should take a look at 43 now. It says, And the Lord said unto Moses and Aaron, we're now going to get into the participants of this. And it says, this is the ordinance of the Passover. These are the instructions. This is, what, this is how it is to be ordered. It says, there shall no stranger eat thereof. But every man's servant that is bought for money, when thou hast circumcised him, then shall he eat thereof. A foreigner and a hired servant shall not eat thereof. In one household shall it be eaten. Thou shalt not carry forth aught of the flesh abroad out of the house. Neither shall ye break a bone thereof. All the congregation of Israel shall keep it. And when a stranger shall sojourn with thee, and will keep the Passover to the Lord, let all his males be circumcised, and then let him come near and keep it. And he shall be as one that is born in the land. For no uncircumcised person shall eat thereof. 
One law shall be to him that is homeborn, and unto the stranger that sojourneth among you. So here we see the participation, some, some clarifications provided for that. In verse 47, we, we see a very clear statement that all the congregation of Israel is expected to keep it. So verse 47, it says, all the congregation of Israel shall keep it. It's very clear. Here's, here's a broad brush statement of the expectation of God. And so it's important to recognize that the congregation included native-born Israelites and those that desired to dwell with them. So it wasn't just the native-born. It wasn't just those that had a bloodline back to Jacob, just those that had a bloodline back to Abraham. When we are here in the context of the original Exodus, the instructions that is going on here is for the native-born as well as those that desire to dwell with them. So we, we see that within here. Uh, and so, so uh, take, taking a look here in verse 48, it says, And when a stranger shall sojourn with thee and will keep the Passover to the Lord, let all his males be circumcised, and them that come near and keep it. And he shall be, be as one that is born in the land, for no uncircumcised person shall eat thereof. So we see participation by non-Israelites. And we see the clarification in verse 49. One law shall be to him that is homeborn and unto the stranger that sojourneth among you. This is further emphasized even earlier when you look at who actually left Egypt. If you go back to verse 37, in the middle of the, of the chapter, we didn't read this, but we have the actual account of the Passover being slain and then God carrying out and slaying the Egyptians and all the firstborns, and then thrusting out the, the Israelites. But it isn't just the Israelites that go out. Take a look at verse 37. It says, And the children of Israel journeyed from Ramses to Sukkoth, about 600,000 on a foot that were men beside children. It says in verse 38, And a mixed multitude went up also with them, and flocks and herds, even very much cattle. So it wasn't just Israelites. It was other individuals, whether it was Egyptians, other, other slaves from other countries, nationalities that said, you know what? We want to follow your God. Your God is where true strength, true power resides. Your God is the true God. We can see that emphasized. And so they joined themselves, and they may have been even individuals, likely so, that had their death of the firstborn within their families. But they said, you know what? Enough is enough. We're not going to stay here with the Egyptians. We're coming with you. And so there's a mixed multitude among the Israelites. So that is a common misconception that this is all about the Israelites. This is not. This is about Israel, God's people, and those that join themselves to God's people. And so the section provides clarity as well here on who, who is expected to participate, but also who is not to participate. So we go back to verse 43. So I read through this. Already, but notice here as we go through this a little slower, it says, The Lord said unto Moses and Aaron, This is the ordinance of the Passover, there shall no stranger eat thereof. So here we see that no stranger is to eat of the Passover. The question becomes we have a stranger here in 43, and we also have in verse 48 a stranger that sojourns with them. So what's the difference between going on here? We're in verse 43, we have the Hebrew word nakher. Nakher, which means foreigner. Is the word stranger a good translation? Yes, it is. But it's the word nakher, which means foreigner. The context refers to someone outside the covenant with God. So someone that is outside the covenant of God, someone that is a stranger or a foreigner, is not to participate in the Passover. Verse 44, But every man servant that is bought for money, that uh, when thou is circumcised, thou shalt eat thereof. So here we see that there is allowance for those outside if a person is a servant that's been purchased for money. If they're owned and they've been circumcised, they can participate. And this is contrasted with verse 45 that I just read, referring to a foreigner and a hired servant shall not eat thereof. So if you're an owned servant or purchased with money, well, then, then you can participate if you've been circumcised. If you have been, if you're just hired, you're just getting paid a wage, well, then you're not supposed to. Remember that own servants were basically part of the family. This is different than this is different than before. This is not to be confused with slavery that existed within the United States. Own servants were treated well and cared for. What is being said here is that non-family members that are part of your household can participate if they're circumcised. 
That's what the verses say here, verse 44. Every man's servant that is bought for money, when thou hast circumcised him, then shall he eat thereof. So if, if they're not part of the blood of the family, but they're part of the family, and they're circumcised, they can participate. Now the purpose of this message is not necessarily to deal with the topic of circumcision, but there's, there is an element that it, it doesn't mean you touched on here. But I believe it's important for now to see its requirements, because it is required to participate in the Passover. Because it was a token, or it was a sign, given to Abraham after he believed in God. Circumcision was not part of the Mosaic Law. It was included in the Mosaic Law, but it already existed and was commanded prior to Moses. It happened with Abraham. And it was an outward sign. Just like baptism today with the New Covenant is connected to the New Covenant, it's an outward sign. It's expression of belief and a connection to the Covenant. But baptism doesn't save. Just like circumcision, never saved. It was always an outward expression connected with belief. Belief in what God had revealed to Abraham. So circumcision never saved anyone. The Bible does not teach that. There are people that believe that, but the Bible doesn't teach it. In verse 44, we see the purchased servant that has been circumcised is an indication they've entered into covenant with Jehovah and consequently want to participate in the Passover meal. So they're part of, they're part of the family. They want to participate. Now verse 45 precludes a hired servant and a foreigner from participating. A foreigner here, again, like I said, it's a different word. This is the word toovav, which refers to an individual not native to the land and was just passing through. In other words, they're not part of Israel, and they're not interested in Israel on a spiritual level. The hired servant has the same idea. They're only there for the money and not part of what is going on in the land. They just want some money, they're going to move on. That's kind of the idea. Now, when we get to verse 48, though, we see that a stranger is allowed to participate. It says, And when a stranger shall sojourn with thee, and will keep the Passover to the Lord, let all his males be circumcised, and then let him come near and keep it, and he shall be as one that is born in the land, for no uncircumcised person shall eat thereof. So we see a consistent theme here. Israelites would be circumcised, and then those that join themselves to Israel, whether you're, you're, you are a purchased or an own servant, part of the family, or if you are a sojourner in the land, then you also, if you want to participate, have to be circumcised. Now, we can get to verse 48 in the English and go, I don't really fully understand the difference of what's going on here. Here is one of the multitude of reasons why it's important to look in the original language. Because the word for stranger here in verse 48 is different than the word for stranger in verse 43. Verse 43 says, that There shall no stranger or nor care uh, eat thereof. But in verse 40, 48, when it says here, And when a stranger shall sojourn with thee, the word stranger is the Hebrew word ger. It's a different Hebrew word. And it refers to a non-native-born person, like a foreigner. However, this individual desires to dwell among Israel. There's a distinction between the words. There's a ger, translated as, 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 a, as a stranger, and then there is a nakar, which is translated as stranger as well. So if you only look at the English, you start getting confused. But the Hebrew pro provides the insight that helps understand the clarification. And so this, can, this word here in verse 48 can simply refer to a Gentile, but it really refers to a convert to a person that becomes a Jehovah worshiper. That's what a ger is, a Jehovah worshiper. The context in Exodus 12 indicates that this is referring to a convert. And so again, take, take, a, look, uh, take a look at Exodus 12 in verse 19. We we'll alluded earlier, I haven't read this verse yet. It says, Seven days there shall be no leaven found in your houses. For whosoever eateth that which is leavened, even that soul shall be cut off from the congregation of Israel, whether he be a stranger or born in the land. So here we have a connection with the Feast of Unleavened Bread. So the seven days that follow Passover. And the Passover is actually eaten the, evening, the, the, the very beginning of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And that is out for this message here. But notice that we have the connection at the end of verse 19, whether he be a stranger, a ger, same word in the Hebrew as found in verse 48. It says, or born in the land. And, and so we have this connection. Those that are Israel or those that are joined to Israel. 
And so you could refer to those as a, a sojourner, one that is dwelling with them. And so we had this idea of stranger or a convert. So this is referring to a Gentile that wants to be part of Israel and is living among the Israelites or living among the way the Israelites live. This person desires to covenant with the Lord. That's why a person desires to be among Israel. It says, so what this is getting at is, is that Israel shall let this person become circumcised and let his household be circumcised and constantly be allowed to participate in the Passover. So God's saying, I'm not just saying only native born, only those that can tie their bloodline back to Abraham or to Jacob can participate, but rather everyone can participate if you want to join yourself unto me. Now, in verse 48, it says, No uncircumcised is to be allowed to eat the Passover. So verse 48 again, at the very end, it says, For no uncircumcised person shall eat thereof. So it becomes clear when looking at the entirety of verse 48 that there is a distinction between the uncircumcised believer and the circumcised believer for participation. Because at the beginning of verse 48, the, the stranger that sojourns among them well, that's a person that desires a covenant with God. So that would, that would refer to an uncircumcised believer. And so the clarification that God is giving to Moses here is that these believers, those, those converts to Jehovah worshipers, need to be circumcised if they want to participate in the Passover. So the, verse 48 is showing the uncircumcised believer versus the circumcised believer. So re remember, circumcision was always about circumcision of the heart. Abraham was circumcised in the heart first. So that's not, that's not a New Testament co uh, concept. That existed in the Old Testament. And so we have the same, the same situation today that existed back here where you could have believers that were uncircumcised, non-native-born Israelites, that if they wanted to participate in the Passover, they had to be circumcised. It's not that they weren't a believer yet because we have the, the, the individual being a stranger that sojourns among thee. And they want to keep the Passover. They want to do what God has laid out. And so when we get to verse 49, which, which says, One law shall be unto him that is homeborn, and unto the stranger or the gayer that sojourneth among you. So it says the same Torah is applicable to the native-born Israelites and to the stranger or the convert, the gayer, that has covenant with Jehovah. This, this is the verse that clarifies that the Torah is not just for the Jews. It's not just for the Israelites. It's not just for the native-born Israelites. And so you go to these passages here, and it becomes very clear when you look at this closely. It is for all people that have covenant with Jehovah. The covenant that was based on the promise to Abraham. That's an important distinction. This was participation in this Passover was not those that had entered into the Mosaic Covenant because that hasn't been established yet. This is based on individuals that have covenanted with Jehovah based on the Abrahamic Covenant, the same covenant that's referenced in the New Testament that we says that, we're, that Paul says we're part of. Remember, the Mosaic Covenant had not been instituted yet. So how, do all this, how does all this transfer into application for our participation in the Passover today? A little more journey here. Like in the days of Moses... While Israel is in Egypt, it was for those believers that entered into covenant with God and demonstrated the covenant participation by taking the token associated with the covenant. And what was that token? Circumcision. If you, if you wanted to participate further in God's covenant, you took his token, which was circumcision. During the Exodus, it was a token of Abraham's covenant, circumcision. But then what happened? with the ratification of the Mosaic Covenant. A new token, or a new sign, was declared to show participation in the covenant. It wasn't a new thing because it had already been participated in, and that was the Sabbath. If you go to Exodus chapter 31, bear with me for a little while I develop this point. Exodus 31. In verse 13, Exodus 31 and verse 13, Speak thou also unto the children of Israel, saying, Verily my Sabbaths ye shall keep. For it is a sign between me and you throughout your generations, that ye may know that I am the Lord that doth sanctify you. And the rest of the whole part here deals with, with the Sabbath day. And, uh, and so...
Let's go down to verse 16. Wherefore, the children of Israel shall keep the Sabbath to observe the Sabbath throughout their generations for perpetual covenant. It is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, and on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. And so he goes right back to creation as being this was the pattern established back then. But now God says, I'm using this as a sign to show that you're covenanted with me. When does this sign be associated with a covenant? Part of the Mosaic covenant. This is the sign of participation of saying, I move forward in the covenants of God, and I'm going to take the next sign to make sure I participate in that. Still observing circumcision. Still identifying with the, with the covenant of Abraham. Moving into the Mosaic covenant saying, I'm also going to take this sign because I'm also progressing. I'm also moving forward in the revelation of God as God's covenants have have continued to be revealed to mankind and and what he desires them to do. And so the Sabbath was the external sign to show one was covenanted with Jehovah. Did this mean circumcision went away? The answer is no. Circumcision did not go away. The reason is because the Abrahamic covenant was still in full force. Just like the Adamic covenant was still in full force. Just like the Noahic covenant was still in full force. It did, when the covenant was presented, the new ones didn't pass away. When we get to the Mosaic covenant, the, the four preceding it do not pass away. And this is the way God's covenants work. They don't pass away. They improve is what ends up happening. Now, uh, so, so those that were in covenant with God had two signs if they were demonstrating that they were with the covenant of God. If they were to keep the Passover... One was circumcision, and the other was keeping the Sabbath. Because individuals that were not keeping the Sabbath would not be allowed to participate with God's congregation. So they were keeping both signs at this point. Because those that don't keep the Sabbath are cut off from Israel. That's part of what's being spoken of here in Exodus 31. Now over time, Israel broke this covenant over and over again. And the Lord judged them for that. But God was faithful to the covenant. It's just Israel that broke it. Now, just before he sent the southern kingdom fully into exile with the Babylonians, he gave the prophecy of a new covenant. Take a look with me to Jeremiah 31, in chapter 31. Some of our side conversations, we've been going here a number of times. This is a critical text that helps individuals understand how God is progressing in his revelation and what he is going to do. And this is also an important text because Paul quotes in Hebrews chapter 8. And so before he sends the southern kingdom away, he gives to Jeremiah this promise in Jeremiah 31, 31. He says, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Keeping in mind at this point, the house of Israel has already been scattered. The house of Israel does not exist. And he's telling Jeremiah, by the way, those people that I pushed off, those people that I divorced, I told you about in chapter 3, those individuals, I'm going to make a covenant with them. And also with the house of Judah. Verse 32, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they break, although I was an husband unto them, saith the Lord, But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, said the Lord, I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts and will be their God and they shall be my people. Who is he talking about? House of Israel and the house of Judah. Who is that? Well, that would be Israel, native born, plus those that have joined themselves to Israel. That's the context going into this. And that can be proved more than what I laid out so far. But notice this new covenant that is mentioned, what is the key element of this thing? It says in verse 33, I will put my law in their inward parts and write it on their hearts. What is this talking about when he says law? This is referring to the Torah. That's the word in Hebrew, by the way. I will put my Torah on their hearts. What happened in Acts chapter 2? The Torah was put on the heart of God's people. The Torah wasn't done away with. It was shown by Yeshua how to to keep it, but it wasn't done away with. God wrote it on their hearts. If God said the Torah is not not legitimate anymore, it doesn't need to be followed anymore for a New Testament believer, why would he write it on our heart? That's a serious question Christianity needs to grapple with. But he says here this is the new covenant uh, for his people. What people? The house of Judah and the house of Israel. Those are his people. 
That's native born plus those that are joined unto him. And so Hebrews 8, Paul clarifies that this is the new covenant that was ratified by the Messiah. I'm not going to go there here, but you can see in Hebrews 8, Paul quotes Jeremiah 31 verbatim. And he says this was ratified by the Messiah. This is what is ratified in what we partake of today as part of the new covenant. And how did the Lord have believers from the Abrahamic and Mosaic covenants show their identification with this new covenant? What was that sign? What was that token that God had believers take to show sign of participation in this new covenant? Well, the Lord sent a forerunner. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 3. The Lord sent a forerunner to the Messiah. And who was that? Does anybody know here? Who is that forerunner? John the Baptist. Right, John the Baptist. And so he sent him, as we see a record of that in Matthew chapter 3. Take a look at verse 1. It says, In those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea, and saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. This is a, this is a Israelite, this is a Hebrew promise, the kingdom of heaven. For this is he that was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. And the same John had his raiment of camel's hair and a leather girdle about his loins, and his meat was locust and wild honey. Then went, then went out to, to him Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region round about Jordan, and were baptized of him in Jordan, confessing their sins. So here we see individuals coming to, to John to be baptized, to be immersed in water. And this was to be a sign of saying, I have repented of my sins and I want to receive the Messiah that's coming. See, John was, was pronouncing, declaring the Messiah is coming. I'm the one preparing the way for the Messiah. Prepare yourselves. And you see people were coming confessing their sins. And notice here, that this was not just for anybody. Verse 7 says, but when, the, but when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come to his baptism, he said unto them, O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come. He says in verse 8, Bring forth therefore fruits meet for repentance. And think not to say within yourselves, We have Abraham to our father. For I say unto you that God is able to, of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. So John says, Don't think that your bloodline gets you automatic entrance into the covenant. Don't think that you're in the covenant just because you're related to Abraham. You need to, you, you need to actually, to even participate in this baptism, what you need to do is bring forth fruit, meat for repentance. What is he saying? He says, demonstrate to me with your words and your actions that you have repented. If you've repented, I'll baptize you. But if you haven't repented of anything, then you have no business being, being water baptized. Why is this? Because baptism is the sign connected to this covenant being ushered in by the Messiah. This additional uh, 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 enhancement to God's covenants that he's been giving to his people all along. And so those that he desired to identify with the Messiah, who would, who would ratify his blood of the new covenant, would be baptized. You see, baptism is the external token connected to the new covenant. It demonstrates publicly you're part of the new covenant. Paul tells us this in Romans chapter 6. So turn a few books forward here, past the Gospels. Take a look at Romans chapter 6. It's very clear, and you can look at this in a number of places, but this is, this is one of the clearest places that tells us that water baptism is the sign of the new covenant. That you've demonstrated you, you, the expression of what's happened in your heart will be expressed in, in this water baptism. So it says here in verse 3 of chapter 6, it says, Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so, also, even so we also should walk in newness of life. And so here the connection is, is that water baptism signifies what the Messiah did. Just like the Messiah died, was buried, and rose again, water baptism signifies the exact same thing. Individual, they died of their sins, they professed that, 
and they're buried, going into the water, complete submersion because it's complete burying of their sins, and they resurrect out of the water to live an, uh, a, a, a new life in the Messiah. So we're not just dead to our sins, we're, we are resurrected with the Messiah to live for him. How do we live for him? By doing what he says we should do. Following that Torah that's written on our heart. Following that Torah that is connected to what we have written in the Bible. And so we should walk in newness of life. We don't just, we don't just, we're not just dead to our sins. We are dead and alive in, through Christ. And so baptism signifies this. And so, so, those, so those individuals that desire to participate in this covenant receive the Messiah will take the sign of the covenant. And so who were these individuals that were baptized? So, of course, it was believers that had repented of their sins. John the Baptist made it very clear. In our scriptures, we can prove that as well, is, is, is what's going on. But also, take note of what's going on in part of the background context here. Individuals that came to John, that we've recorded in, in Matthew chapter 3, would have been individuals that were circumcised as well as keeping the Sabbath. Individuals still participating, still holding to the previous covenants. You see, when baptism was connected to the new covenant, it did not replace the previous signs. You see, individuals, once they were baptized here, they did not stop keeping the Sabbath once they were baptized because they were now entering into the new covenant. They didn't go, oh, the Mosaic covenant has passed away. I'm now under this new thing. I can stop keeping the Sabbath thing. Once they were baptized, they were still holding on under the old, under the old, under the old uh, thing. We do not see these things going away. To be clear, none of these signs, none of these tokens earn one's ability to be saved. All of them are just signs or tokens of someone that has already entered into covenant with God, and they move forward as God continues to reveal himself to mankind. Additional revelation is embraced by the believer. An individual is truly saved when God reveals himself will say, yes, that is truth. When the Messiah came, individuals recognized the Messiah that were truly fellowshipping with God. It's like the disciples said in John chapter 1, the Messiah, we found him, come and see. They were looking for him. They received the baptism of John because they were looking for him. They recognized truth, and that's how these covenants work. So when we get to the gospel, and the Messiah is about to ratify the new covenant with his blood, we have him and his baptized disciples sitting down to eat a meal on Passover. I do not believe it was the Passover meal because it was eaten in the first day of 11 bread. That's when the Passover meal was actually technically eaten. But rather a meal on the day of the Passover, the Passover was killed. So I believe they ate a meal on the day of the Passover. And he specifically connects what he's about to do with this meal, which is connected to the Passover meal. So it's like he's saying, do this as it points to what I'm about to do. And we all understand the teaching on the connection of the bread to his body and the fruit of the vine to, the, to his blood. So I'm not going to go over that. I think most of us understand that fairly well. And the significance of those that are participating in this is bridging the promises of past covenants to the reality of the new covenant. See, that's what's going on here with the Passover, is, is that we have what happens in the past is still presenting the bridge to what's going to happen in the future. So Yeshua, when he participated in the Passover, he didn't say, do away with the Passover, because the exodus happened, and I've got a new thing for you. He says, keep doing this thing. Well, what was this thing he was talking about? The Passover. He says, keep doing this. And after this, individuals keeping and understanding this connection were those that had taken the sign of the new covenant, baptized believers, as well as still holding the other signs. It's clear that Yeshua connected the new covenant with the observance of the Passover. And the observance of the Passover does not go away. And so we'll take a look at 1 Corinthians chapter 11. The observance of the Passover does not go away. So Paul here makes this connection very clear. 1 Corinthians 11, verse 23. He says, For I have received of the Lord that which also I, del which I delivered unto you. At the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After the same manner also, he took the cup. When he had supped, saying, the cup, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. 
So we see here Yeshua dealing with, this is Paul talking about what Yeshua was dealing with, saying, do this in remembrance of me. What is, what is the, 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 the thing that's mentioned in the feast of doing as a remembrance? We see the Passover connected to say, do this as a memorial. And so it's not a surprise to see Yeshua saying, continue to do this memorial, but there's a heightened understanding connected with this. You see, what Yeshua has done is made the significance of Passover all that much more important and meaningful to the believer. It means more to the believer after what Yeshua did than it did for the Israelites and those that were with them that left Egypt from Pharaoh. Does it take it away from what God did before? No, but it makes it more meaningful. The same day, more meaningful. And believers are expected to participate in this. But this participation is connected to the unit of organization in the New Covenant. Now, the new memory verse that we have going on here is in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. So go back there. Same book. Same book here. Notice what I'm going to do here. The same book. 1 Corinthians chapter 5 in verse 7. He says, Purge out therefore the old leaven, that ye may be a new lump, as ye are unleavened. For even Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. Therefore let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the leavened bread of sincerity and truth. He says, keep the feast. What feast? Feast of Passover, we just talked about in verse 7. That's interesting. He says that Paul is talking and admonishing that these believers in Corinth need to be keeping this. That's what he's talking about in chapter 11. It was what Yeshua connected to his death, burial, and, to his death in, in the body and the blood. And as well, we see, we see this uh, same teaching that this was given to a group of people to keep and not just national Israel. Take a look at 1 Corinthians chapter, chapter 10. You see, the participation of this feast is a unit of organization in the new covenant. And what is that, that organization? It's not national Israel. It's not national Israel that Paul is talking about here. It's localized assemblies, otherwise known as churches. The first church was at Jerusalem, made up of, of individuals that had come out of, of, of the previous covenants. And what is that Paul teaches here in 1 Corinthians chapter 10? Take a look at verse 16. So again, so we have 1 Corinthians 5, we're dealing with this, 1 Corinthians 11, and it's also dealt with in chapter 10. Take a look at verse 16. He says, The cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? For we being many are one bread and one body, for we are all partakers of that one bread. And so here we see that he is dealing with the symbolism connected with what many Christianity refer to as the Lord's Supper. But what is the Lord's Supper? It's the Passover. And so he's connecting this, is these focal points of the bread and the juice to his body and blood. But then Paul makes a connection here that this body and the blood or the bread and the juice symbolizes the unity of the assembly partic participating in it. Again, verse 16, the cup of blessing which we bless. Is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? For we being many are one bread and one body. For we are all partakers of that one bread. He is trying to say there's a special unity for churches when they participate in this Passover. It is their unity that they're partaking of this. It is their unity that God expects them to participate in. Now, you see here a phrase in verse 16 at the end. It says, is, not, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? Well, what is this body of Christ? Well, Paul clarifies, he defines it in this very book. If we take a look at the next chapter, two chapters forward, chapter 12, take a look at 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 27. He defines his terms here in verse 27 when he says, Now ye are the body of Christ and members in particular. He says, you, you Corinthians that I'm writing this book to, you are the body of Christ. And if there's any question about who the, this book is written to, this letter, go all back to the beginning of the letter and take a look at chapter 1. Because he says, ye are the body of Christ and members in particular. Well, who is the ye? 
Well, verse 1 of, verse, of chapter 1 says, Paul, called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God, and Sothenes, our brother, unto the church of God, which is at Corinth, to them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints, with all that in every place call upon the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, both theirs and ours. So this is written to the church of God, which is at Corinth. I believe each individual church is a body of Christ. That's what Paul defines it in the book of 1 Corinthians here. It's hard to get around the, the terminology that's being existed. So when you start looking at what he says in 1 Corinthians 5, and how we're supposed to keep the feasts and we're supposed to observe the Passover, you look at chapter 10, it talks about how it is connected with the unity of the body, symbolized by the bread that you're partaking of in this. And you get to 1 Corinthians 11, and he talks about how we're supposed to, to do this. Again, chapter 11, verse 23, For I received of the Lord that which I also delivered unto you, and the Lord Jesus, that the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also he took the cup. And when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood, this do ye as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he come. So the instruction here is to continue to do this until the Lord returns. It says in verse 26, do you do show the Lord's death till he come? This is an instruction that at a very minimum, the Passover is supposed to be observed by his assemblies until the Lord returns. Has he returned yet? No, we should still be keeping this. And so we see this unity, the expectation that the Passover is kept by his assemblies. And so what is it that places an individual into an assembly? Well, this goes right back to uh, baptism. Take a look at Acts chapter 2. Take a look at Acts chapter 2. So what is it that places individuals into a local church? Well, the Bible tells us. That's why baptism is important. Acts chapter 2, in verse 41. After Peter gets done preaching and, and, and telling them to repent... Certain individuals received the words that he had said. Acts chapter 2, take a look at verse 41. It says, Then they that gladly received his word were baptized. And the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. So we see here those that repented based on Peter's message. They received his word. They responded to it. The next thing they do, they were baptized. And it says here, those that were baptized were added unto them about 3,000 souls. So 300 individuals were added unto them. What were they added to? Well, if you look a little further down, we see that that is defined in verse 47. It says here, praising God and having favor with all the people, and the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. Individuals that were saved, they're baptized, and God added to the assemblies. That's the pattern for entering into the new covenant. Now the reality is, is that many individuals that come to faith today, they're not Israelite born. But in Acts chapter 2, they were. There were individuals that were circumcised, keeping the Sabbath, and all the stuff that are connected that came over in what we call the Old Testament. Now today, individuals that believe and repent of their sins, and they, they're saved, they're positionally right with God, they're delivered from their sins, they're covered, and the next thing of obedience they're supposed to do, according to Matthew 28, is after you make converts, is baptize them. Why? Because as it says here in Acts chapter 2, it adds them to the assembly. This is, the, this is the, the vehicle that puts an individual into the, into the spiritual local church that God wants to use. He calls the body of Christ that's supposed to be unified in partaking of the Passover. And so, so what is all of this telling us? Well, I believe this is saying that the qualification for participation in the Passover, the only appointed time that has participation qualifications, I'm not going to go through all the different all the different appointed times, but when you do that, you see this is the only one of the qualifications. It is for baptized believers today, for baptized believers of a local church that are observing the signs and the tokens of his covenants. For males, that refers to circumcision. For males and females, I believe it refers to faithful Sabbath observance and baptism. When you put the pieces together, so males are circumcision, Sabbath observance and baptism. For females, it would be uh, faithful Sabbath observance and baptism. 
and I believe it is observed by the congregation. It's not meant to be a feast for the world to participate in, just like it was outlined in Exodus chapter 12. It wasn't for the foreigner. It wasn't for the hired servant. It wasn't for the stranger that wasn't desiring to be among God's people or covenant with God's people. So just like in the days of Moses, it wasn't for, the, for those individuals, but rather for God's people to recognize. Rather for God's people to memorialize what God has done in the past and also to look forward to what he's going to do in the future. Because you see, as Paul said here in, X, excuse me, in 1 Corinthians 11, we do show forth the Lord's death until he come. We're emphasizing the Lord's first coming and what he's done spiritually and how it points to when he comes a second time and provides the physical deliverance that is pictured in the spiritual reality. The seriousness of these qualifications is part of what Paul is dealing with back in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. So this is the last place we'll turn to. Turn back to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. I should have told you to hold your spot there. So in the very next verses that he had said after verse 26, it says, You do show forth, do show the Lord's death till he come. He says in 1 Corinthians eleven twenty-seven, he says, Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily, or unqualified, shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. Now, we've been through this a number of years ago. This is not talking about damnation in the sense of hellfire, but talking about judgment. Verse 30, For this cause many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep, or have died. For if we would judge ourselves, we should, all, we should not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord, that we should not be condemned with the world. You see, there's a different judging going on here than the world's judgment. So, so here is instruction by Paul to say, be careful of your participation in this. Now, built into this is not only qualifications, but also spiritual assessment before you participate. So I'm not going to get into that. I'm talking, I'm talking more to hear about the qualifications dealing with the participation initially on the outside with the signs and tokens. So what does all this mean for practicality for us today? Because in a couple of weeks, we're going to have on the first day of 11 bread when you eat the Passover meal, and then we'll have our services later on in the evening. It's important to realize this is only for the meal and not for, and for requirements for the meal and not for the services. Thus, those meeting the requirements for the Passover meal can participate. So those, so those that, that meet those qualifications that we talked about. Males, circumcised, baptized, and a member of a grafted branch, faithful to the Sabbath. Females, baptized, or baptized and members of a grafted branch, while being faithful to the Sabbath. For the services that follow, there's no requirements, just like our normal Sabbath services. Anybody can attend. That's fine. But not for the, me for the meal piece as far as participating in the meal itself. You can be there, but you, you, unfortunately you can't participate in it. So those that do not meet the requirements for the Passover can still come. They just can't eat. I believe it's important that we do things as ordered by, by Jehovah. Our goal is here to be biblical and follow the scripture as what Scripture teaches, rather than man-made tradition. So trying to show here today what Scripture is saying, what Scripture is showing us, what it is teaching, the patterns we see, and the individuals following in the direct instructions of Scripture. And so there's a lot said about the Passover, even more so than what we just covered here today, but qualifications are a portion of it. So hopefully it's provided some clarity. Um, uh, and even this is even slightly, a little more, I'd say, refined than what we covered last year. And so as we continue to delve into Scripture, continue to look at this, our desire is to become precise and follow God as he's laid out. So I know for individuals that maybe have not heard a lot of teaching on the Passover or the Feast, the appointed times, this probably opens up more questions than it answers. So, so there's more things that we'll, we'll cover for some of those that maybe have not seen that before. But this lays out very clearly there's a requirement here for participation in this. Let's go ahead and let's close in prayer. 